Everybody, it's always a pleasure to see you down here. I'm actually seeing you up here. Uh, it is my pleasure today to introduce Courtney Embry, who is the recipient of the L.T. Shanks Scholarship from uh, last year. specifically introduce uh, Courtney, I wanted just to let you know what the L.T. Shanks uh, scholarship is because we've, um, we've asked Courtney to speak today um, in, not only to hear what her research has been, which has been absolutely fascinating, but also to encourage other people to apply for the scholarship. So the department has a series of scholarships, as, as you may know, and, and you're the only ones who are competing for them, so you, you know, really, it's really very helpful. Um, it should be very helpful to you. The L.T. Shanks Scholarship is specifically for independent uh, research, and it's the, because we an amount that can go up to, you know, like $3,300, $3,400, it's, it's absolutely something to go for. Uh, so this is a scholarship uh, that's generally uh, awarded to people who do quite a bit of, uh, bit of travel, often travel overseas. We're, uh, in, in part, we pay attention to the, the cost of the travel. We generally, if you want to travel, get money to go to Los Angeles for, you know, you're not a candidate for this scholarship. In other words, it's, it should be a, a, a travel that you can't otherwise afford. Uh, and let, let me just uh, briefly tell you what you need to do to submit for the scholarship. You need to have a very uh, specific proposal. It has to be very well defined. Uh, you need to have a detailed budget and um, a, a portfolio and I think that's about it. The, the people who can apply, the uh, eligibility is for undergrads in the third and fourth year and for graduate students in the second year. Okay. So please, if you have any uh, inkling of an interest in this, uh, I absolutely suggest you talk to a member of the scholarship committee. The committee is chaired by Pablo LaRoche, uh, Erna Ramirez, uh, Mark Schulitz, and I are all members of the committee. And we're very, very happy to talk with you about the scholarships. The deadline for this scholarship and all the scholarships is uh, April the 13th. Okay, so let me just say a few words about Courtney. Lost the email. Um, okay, <laughs> that's terrible. Um, okay, so Courtney is uh, absolutely uh, one of our finest uh, graduate students. Those of us who have had a chance to uh, teach her have always been absolutely uh, delighted uh, to, uh, for the opportunity. Okay, so let me just say a few things. Courtney um, actually got her undergraduate degree here in landscape architecture. She then went on from that experience to uh, uh, work in, in uh, New York and also in London, is that correct? And in a variety of capacities. She has uh, won a number of uh, awards. Her work has been recognized. Uh, singularly and as a team member. So she's, she came, when she returned to Cal Poly, we were very, very happy because uh, she's obviously an extremely gifted designer. So, thanks. Thank you, Lauren. Okay. So I'm really concerned about not being heard, so if you don't hear me, just say something. I'll try to do that. Okay, um, so for today I prepared a narrative for this twofold research that weaves both the study of a collection of Bauhaus architecture in Tel Aviv, as well as an urban studies discourse on technology and the urban fabric. So what inspired me to travel to Tel Aviv, which is where I live on this, uh, for the scholarship, um, what inspired me began as an investigation into the industry of technology and the industrial, I'm sorry, just as the industrial economy made a physical impact on urban cores, manufacturing plants and factories, I was interested in the new post-industrial knowledge-based economy and its physical appearance within the fabric of a city. So what you see up here is the proposal that I submitted. Um, and it 
posed the question of what do Silicon Valley, Tel Aviv, and Los Angeles have in common? And the response to that was they have the top three strongest startup ecosystems in the world. Tel Aviv is particularly relevant in technology as it is ranked number two entrepreneurial city in the world. So my research question was, what is the social and physical impact of the tech economy on the urban form of Tel Aviv? Additionally, I was interested in exploring the architectural profile of Tel Aviv and issues of historic preservation of its uh, collection of Bauhaus architecture. So I'm just going to cover a little bit of historical and geographical context. So Tel Aviv is located in the Middle East. It's neighboring Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and, uh, and Egypt. Um, it's, uh, it's Israel's largest metropolitan area and most populous city, and it has about 500,000 um, inhabitants. And this is just a scale comparison of the inner circle of Paris and the greater city of Tel Aviv. So the city of Tel Aviv was founded in 1909. It's a relatively new city. Um, and it was founded immediately north of the walled port city of, of Jaffa on the hills along the eastern coast of the Mediterranean um, during the era of the British rule in Palestine. This was in 1917 to about 1950. Um, it developed into a thriving urban center, becoming its most famous economic and metropolitan nucleus. So this image shows an immigrant camp in Israel for temp uh, temporary uh, Jewish refugees. Um, it was meant to provide accommodation for a large influx of Jewish refugees arriving into Palestine. It also shows what the, the natural landscape was before the city was uh, constructed. It was all, it was all sand. So after the founding of municipal Tel Aviv in 1921, Mayor Dizengoff needed a master plan for the town. He looked for a city planner, and uh, he wanted somebody sympathetic to the Zionist movement. Um, and Sir Patrick Geddes was chosen for the, uh, the job of laying out the city. And he was actually a Scottish city planner and a biologist. So as a biologist, he saw the city as a circulation system, with large main boulevards running north and south, and then smaller streets running east and west. The large boulevards would be the main circulation arteries with the main commercial activities and taller buildings, and he called these main ways. So each block had a central garden surrounded by buildings which were accessible, which were accessible from the smaller surrounding roads. The central gardens were also the areas where small public buildings or facilities would be constructed. By allowing these small buildings which faced either towards the small access roads or the public gardens, all inhabitants would have access to light and air, which was very important in this very hot and humid climate. Also, immigrants from different countries would fill these blocks, and then, of course, social integration would happen. Um, so the architecture of Tel Aviv is a synthetic representation of some of the most significant trends of the modern movement, specifically the international style, of course. Um, the white city, as it's referred to, is also an example of the implementation of these trends taking into account local cultural traditions and climatic conditions as well. This is just another historic image. Okay, so throughout this presentation, I'm going to talk about, like I mentioned, the two, the two um, topics, which is the first is the international style in Tel Aviv, the architectural fabric, as well as my um, a de a de a discourse on my, um, on my thesis. So right now I'm going to talk about the architecture, and then I'll go into my thesis, and then I'll go back to the architecture. Okay. Hopefully it's not confusing. So the first piece that I'm going to talk about is a residential project, and it's called um, 3EIO, and I'm calling it Components in Opposition. So, so three EIL is a three-dimensional corner composition made into two consecutive, uh, made in two consecutive steps that are actually in opposition, opposition to each other. 
Um, the first is the podium, which is one and a half stories high, flanked by two symmetrical staircases that lead up into a garden, which I don't think exists anymore. But. So the second main bulk of the structure is positioned on top of the pedestal. And it's a simple contrasting block with rows of balconies in front that lighten the composition, including the pergola on the roof. The rounded windows um, on the far left um, are the output of an innovative steel profile from the 1930s when extrusion and steel rolling were, in, were new techniques. And these types of innovation and architectural detail made the, uh, made the architects look forward to machine age production. So the staircase leading up to the main platform is actually as a Russian constructivist influence um, with its geometric flair and the reveals. So my next project I'm showing uh, is another residential building and it's by the aisle, it's on the same street. And this one's variations in surface. So the success of this building um, is actually in the elevation and also in the balcony. Um, it has a variation of surfaces that are achieved by the treatment of the balustrades and use of an off-white pebbled stucco and brown ceramic tile, which I'll show in a moment. So this is the facade. Um, so the balustrade is broken off vertically from the second one, with the first one having horizontal markers that mark the repetition of the floors, and then the second um, with the steel detail on it. Um, and then this shows the brown tiles, which are very important. So this one also shows <clears throat> the porthole windows, which um, reflect a layer of the Corbusian influence and also the ship design. Uh, the next one is 68 Yael, also on the same street. So this one um, I call, um, this one was a loss in translation, I guess, um, where the architect wanted to um, he wanted to uh, incorporate this large, large Corbusian window with this um, large or this very thin balcony um, that faced the street. However, because of the window facing the south, the design element had the unintended consequence of making the apartment really hot. So the translation was lost. Um, okay. So as I mentioned earlier, the, the um, there is this climatic variation in the style um, due to the very hot and humid climate. Um, so these are just some images showing some of these variations. Um, some of these, uh, so these designs were adopted, um, um, I'm sorry, so, some, uh, so the first image on the right um, shows, or the left, I'm sorry, shows the balconies with this very thin slit in the bottom and that the purpose of that was to get air circulation into the balcony. Um, yeah. And then also, um, the, a lot of these windows or balconies were actually covered by, um, by these shutters, which were added on later, which was actually kind of a, um, an Arab influence or a Middle Eastern influence. And then lastly, the sunken windows, which um, reduced the glare. Okay, um, I think a couple more of these examples. Um, this next one is Shlomo Hamalek. And so this one, this one was considered an unfortunate symmetrical approach that was intensified by the fact that it sits on a corner. So the building looks as though it's intended for a larger site in part because of the exaggerated monumentality. Um, as well as the cylindrical element um, on the corner, including the assertive grid on, on the top. Um, and so, and I just want to mention also the purpose of these rounded corners, which you'll see in a lot of these buildings, is to soften the corners. Um, so much that every building has a rounded corner. So, so on the other hand, this building actually was kind of successful from a, a social point of view. Um, the ground floor unit had been appropriated as a local spot for the neighbor, neighboring resi residents, and then also it solidifies this cafe culture that is very big in Tel Aviv, and Tel Avivians can sit at cafe 
things for hours. Okay, so if you notice that the, the past few examples I've showed you have been <coughs> tagged on, or they have a lot of graffiti on them, and they're not in the greatest condition. Um, so I thought I might cover just graffiti really quickly. Um, so graffiti is this ubiquitous layer of the, of the city fabric in Tel Aviv and all of most of Israel as well. So it started as a social protest type of art, but the people who had a lot of anger, from the people who had a lot of anger and very strong ideals about the government, about capitalism, and themes of inequality. This anger was translated into forcing the messages onto public space and uh, creating vandalism. Some say that it's a window into Israeli society with many themes of religion, politics, and some even seeking asylum. Graffiti is technically illegal in Israel, however, you only get fined if you pull your can of spray paint out in broad daylight, so nobody's hunting you down if you're, if you're you know, painting on the walls. Um, even so, Tel Aviv municipalities sometimes promote artists to come out on, at certain locations of the city and, and produce art on the walls. Um, this image is actually of um, a pretty prominent building that's at a very, um, a very large intersection. So this building is seen quite well, and it's, it's just interesting how it has so much graffiti on it. And this is an historical image um, that I found. So back to uh, another residential project. So Shlomo Hamalek has this U-shaped configuration, um, which was an important aspect of the design because it was believed that the space it constructed to, could uh, create togetherness and community, which is all, again, part of that garden city movement, the principles of, of having this, this garden in the center. Um, but the area, which is shown in black, is actually now used uh, for parking, which uh, most of the uh, of these um, garden buildings uh, have parking on the at the garden now because there's a big issue with car congestion, and uh, the public transportation system in Tel Aviv isn't so great, so there's a lot of cars. So this is these are some images of this. Um, so. So, like I said, most of these buildings celebrated the idea of the garden. Um, however, they also were very high in maintenance. So, um, as the city kind of went through this period of decline, um, a lot of those gardens were kind of just left to to just kind of become in disrepair. And so, I just wanted to mention that. Um, this neighborhood um, and other neighborhoods in Tel Aviv have this type of rent control. And this term is called key money in Tel Aviv. And this allows for families that have made financial contributions um, to the building decades ago to pass along this very inexpensive rent uh, to their descendants. So what this results in is a very uh, kind of a younger demographic able to live in, in these types of communities or the city center, um, where their rent is actually equivalent to like 200 US dollars, whereas if you didn't have rent control or key money, it would be about 2,500 a month for a unit. And then also, um, so given, given the lack of resources, the materials used were not uh, the most sophisticated. Um, and in some instances, uh, elements from the landscape are used to fill in the concrete, such as shells and sand. Um, and this kind of supports the fact why the buildings have deteriorated in such a way, um, and also the plaster uh, did, didn't take very well to the, to the environment. So there's a lot of flaking paint. So this kind of, um, this is where I segue into decay, um, which is a huge part of the, of the um, aesthetic of Tel Aviv. And um, so you'll be walking along the street and you'll see some beautiful buildings and you'll see some buildings that are missing windows you know, in this condition. And it's kind of, in a way, charming, in my opinion, um, depending on who you talk to, it's um, charming. The, so the effects of time and the passage of time are very visible. 
and buildings in Israel, some buildings in Israel, as it appears, are just kind of left to crumble. However, there's always these signs of life and prosperity that emerge from the fabric that seem to not take notice of the decaying aesthetic. So this kind of leads one to believe that there's something else going on under the surface that can't be accessed into it until you really become part of the community. Those are just some images. And there you can see the, the slit in the balcony, um, which has been enclosed by shutters. So now I'm kind of moving into more of my, what I wanted to focus on for my thesis, was, which was the tech economy and its effects on the city fabric. Um, so, so logistically, um, Tel Aviv is it's in a Middle Eastern country, seemingly always in the midst of conflict and somewhat isolated from other tech cities. And this raises the question of why is Israel one of the top tech cities in the world? It's kind of in a, a strange position to be that way. Um, so I kind of would like to believe that this condition of the built environment of Tel Aviv could be analogous to the Israeli spirit of Shatzba. So the idea of Shatzba is um, gall, brazen nerve, having incredible guts, um, presumption, and even arrogance. And whether it's at home or in school or in the army, Israelis learn early on that assertiveness is the norm and that reticence is something that risks you being left behind. So Israel's attitude and informality flow also from a cultural tolerance for what some Israelis call constructive failure or intelligent failure. So most local investors believe that without tolerating a large number of these failures that it's impossible to achieve true innovation. So even the Israeli army, of which both men and women are required to serve, and these are just some, some girls that are, I don't know what they're doing, but there's this tendency to treat performance, both either successful or unsuccessful, as value neutral. And so in other words, there's no excessive praise for good performance, and likewise, there's no harsh punishment for failure. Um, and then even when I was, when I was in Israel, I, I interviewed a venture capitalist, his name is Joe Robby, um, and he, he actually worked in New York City, and then he moved back to Israel, he moved back to Tel Aviv. And I asked him about the difference between American Israeli modes of business, and he responded, with, or I'm sorry, the difference between American and Israeli modes of business. And he responded with, when I did business in New York, it would take weeks for us to prepare meetings, and the meetings were very formal, where you'd have to wear a suit and a tie. And that's not the case for the Israeli startup ecosystem, where there are, where we are a testing bed for ideas, and we don't waste precious time worrying about if things are perfect or if they don't look a certain way. And so he said basically Israel offers this quick feedback on product and they don't they launch these products without hesitation. So again, it, it can be assumed that this idea of Shutzba is reflected in the aesthetics of the city and the treatment of the architecture where you see a lot of imperfection, a lot of quick repairs, the use of cheaper materials in some cases, and then the lack of worry about keeping everything beyond a certain standard. Okay, so now I'm going to go into I'm going to go into my thesis and a little bit about the tech economy in Tel Aviv. And I call this binary opposition. So I'm going to talk about two tech archetypes that are related in terms or concepts, but are opposition, in opposition to each other. So the first is the technopole typology. And this is a tertiary hub on the periphery of the city. It is a contemporary equivalent of the post-industrial model, however, it chooses an isolated position on the outside of the city. The technopole provides for tech companies a large campus-style grounds with a sprawling landscape dotted with similar looking mid-rise buildings and surface parking. So it also rejects urban exchange between both individuals and organizations. And it's in conflict with the contemporary perception that the urban environment nurtures innovation. 
So these typologies are sold as innovative environments, however, they are often, often ever realized. So this, this map I'm showing is, is one of the largest um, high-tech zones in Tel Aviv. So this map shows what I'm calling zoning logic um, of some of the most prominent techno poles in the greater Tel Aviv area. The center dash area um, is central Tel Aviv, so you can see that these are on, on the outskirts of the city. Um, and the reason for that, it has a lot to do with economics, um, the cost of land. So I just wanted to show an image of this high-tech zone, like one of the largest ones, um, that one. And so we've, we've, seen all these, we've seen these before. They're, they're pretty standard in most large cities, usually in, in a suburban setting. OK. So the next thing I'm going to go into is this, this um, it's a government policy called Vacate and Build. And this kind of came about um, given the, the lack of housing in Tel Aviv and the influx of foreign, um, foreign workers that have been coming in. So just to explain what it is, it's government policy and in practice um, it allows private real estate developers to raise old and decrepit housing in lower socioeconomic areas and erect luxury high rises. Um, the original owners are given new apartments, and then the rest of the units are sold off at market price. So this policy is relevant because, and like I said, it's in response to this growing population. Um, so this this one in particular is Neve Shuret, and you can see it's uh, directly adjacent to one of the largest um, tech zones, high tech zones in Tel Aviv. So. Neve Shored is one of, um, it's, it's a working class neighborhood. It's full of apartments that center around a community of gardens. So it's, it was designed in the 1950s. Um, so it, it had this, has this, um, it was during the garden movement, the garden apartment movement, excuse me. Um, and it was kind of a way station for new immigrants from North Africa. And what, what's important about it is it stands in stark contrast to the surrounding neighborhoods in Tel Aviv, which are actually um, very wealthy. So this neighborhood's full of apartments, and um, I'm sorry, so 40% of this uh, resident, uh, the residents in this neighborhood are immigrants, and then fewer than 25% um, actually have degrees. Um, and so this, this kind of puts it's this disadvantaged neighborhood in the middle of this island, in the middle of this uh, wealth, basically. So currently, um, so this image is kind of important. It's just showing the new high rises that are being constructed, and this is the first phase. Um, and then it's in the foreground. There's um, the existing, um, the existing apartments. So currently, six apartment blocks, 450 apartments have been vacated and um, are being and, and they are making way for about 1,200 new apartments. Um, and Tel Aviv is actually approved to make the, the vacate and build plans for this entire neighborhood. So all 3,000 apartments, which house about 7,500 people, um, will uh, have to be vacated. So many have voiced criticism about this policy, that it's insensitive to low-income renters, and that it does not solve the issue of lack of affordable housing. So in March of 2012, professionals in the field of affordable housing from Boston uh, visited their colleagues in Israel to share experiences about affordable housing community development. And so the final assessment uh, concluded that um, that Tel Aviv should be skeptical about the demolition and redevelopment projects, especially focused on high-rise development. Um, redevelopment projects should include investment in community facilities and social programs along with, alongside residential and commercial buildings. And another um, item that was stressed was the importance of saving and renovating existing housing as referred to, as preferred to building um, new, if at all possible. 
so this image shows just a commercial district in, in Nevisharet. Um, it's, it's a very small community. Um, and so lastly, the committee was concerned that the tenants living in Nevisharet, um, if they were concerned with their well-being and if they were going to um, have housing provided for them, and nobody really knows that, so they might get displaced. Okay, I'm gonna shift a little bit um, and talk about a different typology, the second um, tech archetype, uh, which is the cluster typology. Um, okay, so as late as the 1950s, industry was located downtown, which was allowed for development of uh, specific social diagrams and, form, and forms of collectivity. Um, the cluster typology takes on a similar configuration but is further aggregated within the fabric. The locations are not predetermined collectively, but chosen on an individual basis from the notion that proximity equals synergy. The tech clusters are also made up of multiplicity of uses, and they have a spontaneous evolution versus a prescribed one like its technopole counterpart. So this is a map uh, of urban tech clusters in central Tel Aviv, and it's made up of startups, venture capitalists, incubators, co-working spaces, research and development centers, and tech community services. It shows the nodes, which are the black dots, um, throughout the city, and then their, respect, their respective spheres of influence, with the largest node um, being Rothschild Boulevard, which is um, blown up in the far left corner. Okay, so this is a map just showing the nodal logic versus the zoning logic. So, so Rothschild Boulevard is one of the largest nodes on the map, like I mentioned earlier. It's an attractive public thoroughfare that provides recreation, it provides, uh, provides amenities, and it makes an interesting place to work, um, which, can, which can explain why it has the most dense tech-related clustering around it. Uh, the environment where one works is a very important factor to the general happiness and productivity of professionals. And Rothschild Boulevard has an active pedestrian-oriented boulevard with the Green Belt Running Lawnics Center and the kiosks. So having access to natural light, quiet and lively spaces, access to both indoors and outdoors or even dark spaces are important because they support the idea of an environment that can be changed and changing a physical environment of, of a worker um, might have a positive psychological effect on doing work. So many, many of the offices, office spaces within the buildings along and around Rothschild are occupied by, by the tech economy. And these are just some images of Rothschild. So, um, in Tel Aviv, the city has transformed certain floors of their main public library into a variety of spaces to facilitate co-working. Um, so a critical component for the library to function is its location near this main tech hub, which you can see in this map here. Um, and the idea of repurposing parts of the main public library it evolved from the idea of nurturing one of its strongest economic drivers, which is the tech economy. So co-working is a style of work that involves a shared working environment, but usually hosts independent activity. Unlike a typical office environment, the co-workers are usually not employed by the same companies. And this is inside that space I'm talking about, the co-working space. Um, so it's an assembly of people that are still working independently but who share the same similar values um, and seek the synergy from working with like-minded people. So when books were the only source of knowledge, a great place to work was the public library where one, where one could be surrounded by books. And as information technology has advanced, where the internet has become a primary source of knowledge, the traditional use of a library has needed to adapt. So. Okay, 
So the, the technopole versus the cluster typology. So the tech cluster is analogous to the current pace of technology in a way. Um, it doesn't waste time constructing the perfect shell in which to do business. So this, this raises the question of the fate of the vast and sprawling technopole. Will it become obsolete and you know, what will become of it? Uh, before I go into that. Um, and then I just wanted to bring up Keller Easterling, which was an ur who's an urbanist and professor at Yale, and she wrote a piece called Subtraction that analyzes the urgency of building subtraction. And she stated that often as, often treated as a failure or a loss, subtraction, when accepted as part of an exchange, can be growth. All over the world, sprawl and overdevelopment have attracted swollen or failed markets and exhausted special landscapes. However, in failure, buildings can create their own alternative markets of durable spatial variables that can be managed and traded, and traded by citizens and cities rather than global financial industries. I'm going to go into one more vacate and build project. Um, this one is in Florentine, which is actually a very different neighborhood than Nebuchadnezzar. So Florentine, um, it's a neighborhood beyond the border of, uh, just beyond the border of the Palestinian side. Um, and it was built to welcome Jews who would work in the port of, of Jaffa. Um, Jaffa um, so it's actually located in one of the largest tech uh, tech hubs in Tel Aviv. So aside from open conflicts within Israel and Palestine, the Jewish Arab neighborhood is it's it is a key space where to observe the diversity and the complexity and the counterculture of the city. It's a vivid working class neighborhood and it's located um, in the poorer south section of the city and was once and still is an enclave for immigrants. <coughs> At one point it was completely walled off from the rest of the city with a dense uh, defense barrier that was created between it and the neighboring affluent neighborhood of Nevesere. In the 1950s, the neighborhood fell so deep into decay that it was deemed inappropriate for living due to the deprivations in municipal investment. In recent times, it has experienced an influx of diversity in population and is now, of course, considered a desirable place to live and experience and to experience what would closely resemble what Tel Aviv used to be in the past. So the neighborhood has an assortment of small businesses focusing on spices or other goods. And then of course the graffiti and other traces left in the streets and on the walls of Florentine by successive waves of population <coughs> constitute the complexity of, of the place. So in recent years, it has been experiencing um, high riseification. I just need that word up. Um, <laughs> or the construction of high density development and many other, as many other cities around the world have been experiencing. Um, so much of this is in response to the citywide housing shortage, of course, and then the influx of foreigners, like you mentioned. Um, some believe that this is threatening to change the neighborhood's character entirely. So as you can see in this image, there's a high rise being built kind of on the outskirts of this neighborhood. And so this is the site where the high rise in the background is. Um, this is the vacate and build project um, that I want to talk about. It was done in, in 2012. Um, and so this is kind of a close up of it at the, at the street level. So this image shows the dichotomy of the new development and the existing fabric. And it also alludes to the intensification of the disparity between much of the existing population and then this new population that's moving in. Okay, now to completely change directions. Um, I'm gonna talk, the rest of this presentation I'm going to talk about, um, I'm gonna talk about more traditional style architecture. So this next project, um, 12 Tel High, has its most, promise, its most uh, prominent feature um, being the balcony, which is a very, very important architectural um, in Tel Aviv. So the balcony is it's very important because of its political and social roots. 
it celebrates identity without being secretive, and it's an ex it's an architectural expression of being extroverted. So this expression is very important for a culture that has been at times um, forced to be pressed, and it helps them kind of tell everyone about their true identity. That's the idea behind the technology. And then additionally for this project, um, a lot of the dominant elements of the international style were the horizontal with the contrast of the vertical elements at the staircase. And these are just a few more images. So uh, like I mentioned before, the balcony is very, very important to Tel Avivians. Um, and sometimes renovation projects uh, will only include the renovation of the balcony the other, the rest of the building kind of in its current state or whatever. Um, so I see a lot of this kind of stuff. You guys still make? Okay. Um, so this this project, which is shown on the on the left, is a renovated um, Bauhaus building in Jaffa, which is the, the Arab community of Tel Aviv. So this building um, has some slight departures from um, what characterizes the, I guess, the Tel Aviv uh, Bauhaus style. And it was originally equipped with these slatted wood blinds, and then it has this pronounced opulence that's kind of different from the, from the other works. And another further departure was the use of stone, which is you only see in this, in this part of the city, um, which was very well liked by the Arab people and seldom used in, in Bauhaus design. Uh, this building was, um, it's actually kind of unique because it's part of a public square, um, which is not something that you would typically see in, in this style. And then this just sort of shows the contrast of the old and new. The renovation of this building was likely funded, or it was, it was probably happened because this is actually a very affluent area. Um, and it's also next to the Pishpishin market, which is a very popular market. Okay. So, the design of a public square in the middle of the 20th century using a very modern approach was kind of unique. Uh, Dizengoff Square is an example of, of, just, of just that. And the square is, is still considered a symbol of Tel Aviv, and it is also a chief exhibit of the prevailing style of its time. It was, it was a result of a public design competition uh, won by a young Jewish architect. So the main idea was to create this public space that was encircled by the all-important balcony. Um, so it was just the entire circle of balconies. Um, and this is just an aerial view of it. So formerly the circle, the interior circle used to be at grade and it formed kind of this public meeting space. And then in the 1970s, due to traffic conditions becoming too harsh, um, this led to the, the current modifications of bringing the traffic underneath the square and then lifting the square up. This is one of the buildings that's part of the circle of balconies. Um, and so at the time, the technology to make these balconies that, that kind of jut out into the street um, it wasn't, they didn't have the appropriate technology is what I'm trying to say. Um, so a lot of these balconies used a, they used plastered wired mesh, which was, uh, which actually rusts. So a lot of the balconies are unusable unless they were renovated. Fiber reinforced concrete was a problem. And this is just one of the, the most prominent buildings in the circle. So, so decoration, like I said, a lot of the balconies may not be usable. Um, so there's actually a lot of decoration around Tel Aviv that is um, that kind of soaks up the idea of the international style. And this is just one example showing this, these round balconies, but they're not really balconies. Yeah. And then this is a modern uh, or contemporary um, uh, high rise that has that same like rounded corner approach. So the style or the the um, the idea is there, but the function is not really there. And then, yeah, balcony. Okay, I have two.
two more projects to go, and I'm almost done. Um, so this one, um, so 85 Rothschild, Rothschild is an example of, the, of an extensive thorough preservation project. And this was to be the home of a doctor. It was designed in the 1930s by a Jewish architect, and it's a three-story residential home. So it has been said that the preservation of the Bauhaus collection has been a hobby of the elite, not to mention that the cost of preserving one of these buildings is very high. And the process, it also involves a lot of coordination and uh, with municipalities and other organizations. So another pending issue is that the requirements for restoring a building including, uh, includes the use of a certain type of plaster, which can only be found in Italy. This is what I was told. Um, and so it also has a short lifespan, so that leads to another problem of making a renovation and having to make another renovation in a short period of time after. This is my last one. Um, 33 Frischmann. Um, this is one of the most original examples of the vertical staircase element. That it, it, um, and it uses these repeated concrete fins uh, protecting um, and uh, protecting the uh, window that's behind it, the staircase that's behind it. So it is it's cut away from diagonally from the main volume of the block and it has a dynamic presence on the street. And from the inside, uh, the fins play an effective role um, in mitigating the strong sunlight that, and producing the shadows. So the housing structure has been nicknamed the thermometer house because it because it pacifies the extreme heat, of course, and then it also looks like a thermometer. So I'm finished. <laughs> I want to say thank you very much. And um, if you uh, if you're thinking about applying, I really think you should, and start thinking about your idea now. If you if you want to travel, um, and, and I also want to say thank you to the faculty very much. describe it because it's kind of a work in progress. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, this, the whole um, kind of the urban phenomenon of, of that happening. And, and it's also an interesting thing because this industry, which is very pervasive, um, it may not leave this kind of uh, architectural legacy because there's not that much that it needs to house. You know, there's not a product that it needs to produce other than something that is not tangible. Um, that's a good question. I actually, um, I bought a book and I went on a tour when I was there too. So I got a lot of information from both the book and the tour. But um, I kind of knew like some key points that I wanted to see for the, the architecture. But a lot of these, a lot of these houses I didn't um, know about until I went on the tour. And then I 
talked to some people too. And I went to the I went to um, the architectural archives at the uh, Museum of Modern Art in Tel Aviv too. So they had some stuff. How long were you in Israel? Ten days. And it actually it takes a lot of energy to to take photos of these things because you have to go at the right time of day, and hopefully it's not raining. You know. So it's it takes it takes a long it takes a lot of energy and time to capture all of this. So if you guys plan on you know making an itinerary, just give yourself a lot of time. Like don't spend an hour here, an hour there. You know, just take a full day to see what you want to see and document. Sarah was just reminding me that there's a range of scholarships that are available. Uh, obviously, Courtney is a recipient of the LT Shanks. But uh, if you go, totally clear where you go online. Some of you, some of you already identified uh, where you go online to look for scholarships. You have. OK, very good. Um, then you'll see that there are scholarships that are strictly to help you with your tuition. Uh, uh, costs, uh, and there are uh, other scholarships that are more kind of specific, like there's a kind of drawing-based one, hand-drawing-based one, and um, there's, a, there's a range, but I think pretty consistently uh, we are looking for, uh, we'll want to look at your portfolios, uh, we do uh, pay attention to your GPA, uh, and, and Excuse me. In many cases, uh, the, your, your need, your financial need, is part of uh, the factor uh, factoring as well. I don't know if you have other specific questions related to scholarships. We have, quite, we have quite a few, and then of course, in addition to these tuition-based scholarships, there are also scholarships if you are planning on going abroad, like say during your fourth year, and um, so we offer some money to help you with expenses for that as well. Okay, please, please apply. The worst thing for the scholarship committee is not to have enough, you know, applications or a sufficient number of applications. We really encourage you to apply. 